I checked the room to make sure about this. I made sure that Pastor Craig would not be here tonight. And I'm pretty sure that Pastor Mark is not in the immediate vicinity either. And for that reason, <laughs> don't know what that was about, but, but for that reason, I need you to keep what's about to happen in this room between us. Sometimes we need to do some things to shine a light on God's Word that can unlock different parts of our minds and our hearts. And occasionally, you have to look to some of the great people and great works of art and literature to illuminate and enlighten these things in your life. So you just have to promise me, you are not going to tell Pastor Craig or Pastor Mark about what we're about to do, okay? That's the thing I'm asking. So one of these people that is one of the great minds of the earth right now. One of the people that can maybe illuminate us to some truth tonight is a guy that goes by the name of DJ Khaled, and I have a photo of him here. You might have seen him before, and you might not have. If you don't know who he is, I will inform you. He is technically a musician. Technically, he's a DJ. But really, he is a, he's a social media personality, and he says funny stuff and he'll say his own name very loudly, and he's, just, he's fun to watch. He does a lot of things. He's very funny. One of my favorite quotes from him is, I don't even know what the context was, but he said, congratulations, you played yourself. That's my favorite thing I've heard him say. But the reason I bring him up is for a reason, believe it or not. There is a video of DJ Khaled from a few years ago where he's basically giving like a motivational speech, essentially, in the video. And when I say what I'm about to say, some of you are going to know what I'm talking about. In the video, there's a part where he goes, this is the part of the video for when you're doing like sit-ups or push-ups. Another one, another one, another one, and another one. That's the video. So that quote where he says another one, another one, another one, has kind of become a joke uh, that people use for different things about DJ Khaled saying another one. And so what I want to do is maybe demonstrate for you uh, how the joke of this works. It might work something like this. Uh, me at the buffet line after filling up five plates of food and needing to sit back down. Another one. <laughs> like that. Uh, here's another one. My wife, after saying that she is going to buy only one item on Amazon and nothing more. Another one. Okay. Are you seeing how this goes? So even, you, you can make this biblical. So you could say, Israel in the book of First and Second Kings after having four wicked kings in a row and needing tur to turn back to the Lord. Another one. Okay. Uh, Israel, after God saying to them, literally, you just one rule, don't have any other gods other than me. And another one. Okay, that's kind of how it works. Uh, Texas A&M winning another national football championship. Mm. Oh, okay. You, you can't another one something that's never happened. Uh, I went to Baylor. It's not like we've won anything either. But Okay, let's not, get, let's not get derailed. Let's keep talking about this. So this another one idea, sometimes our minds another one us, meaning they distract us from what we need to do. So an example for you, sometimes I will go into the grocery store knowing what I need to buy. Like I need to go in and I'm going to buy a steak and some vegetables and some water because that's what I'm going to eat. But if you're like me, if you walk into the grocery store when you're hungry, your brain tricks you. You know, you walk in, you know what you want, but you walk into the aisle and out of the corner of your eye, you notice the aisle where all the chips and candy is another one. Your brain does that to you. You keep walking. You're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You walk up to the aisle where there's cookies. You see it. And you're and like, another you, one. oh man, I know. I just got to keep going. Finally, you, you walk even farther and there's more unhealthy food and just another over and over one. again, another one and another one. And you know, it, sometimes we, our brains, our minds and the world around us try and move us away from what we know is right into this another one. Let's make it maybe slightly more serious. You might know in, in your heart and in your life, that Jesus is the Lord of the universe, you've given your life to him, and that all you need is to be saved by grace through faith through him. That's what God calls you to do. But then maybe someone brings up a question to you and says, are you sure that Jesus is the only way to God? Another one. Or maybe they'll say, well, Jesus is the only way to God, but what you really have to do is you specifically have to believe this exact theological thing that I believe in order for God to be pleased with you. And another one. So the reason I bring all this up is to say the world, sometimes from the outside and sometimes from within, is going to try to DJ Khaled us. It's going to try to another one you away from the truth. But the challenge that you and I have, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, is that we have to be able to differentiate the truth from all of the extra stuff. 
So and that's, that's our challenge for tonight. All we have to do is stay away from the another ones and stay on track with the thing that is true. Another and that is, one. Okay, that's, that's enough of that for now. We can, another one. Are you kidding me? Congratulations, oh. you played yourself. Okay, that was my favorite. The congratulations, you played yourself. Okay, with all that distraction, why don't we get to what we're actually going to be reading tonight? We are in Galatians chapter 1, and Paul is concerned for the Galatians about the fact that they have abandoned the truth of the gospel for another one. And we talked in the previous couple weeks about this, the fact that this is as fiery of a tone as Paul uses anywhere else in the New Testament, and we will start to see why in just a moment. Verse 6 says this, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. We see here that Paul starts in a state of dumbfounded shock with the Galatians. He says, I am astonished, I am amazed that you have done this, that you've so quickly deserted him who called you by the grace of Christ. This is the part of the letter in Paul's letters where usually he will start to give thanks for individual people who have ministered to his life. So after his grace and peace to you through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father, he then will say, I thank you for this and I thank you for that. In this passage, he gets straight into what he's upset with them about because they have so quickly abandoned the gospel that they heard for something different. So they deserted the one who called them by grace, and they basically have switched their allegiance to something different. And just so you know what is going on in this passage, from what we understand, people came into these Galatian churches after Paul and told these mostly Gentile believers, it's good that you're following Jesus, but there is more that you need to do if you want to be one of God's people. So you're following Jesus, but you also need to uh, follow the Jewish food laws. You also need to follow the Jewish religious calendar. Uh, for, for the men, they need to be circumcised because to be one of God's people, this is what you have to do. Our first big point for tonight is this. It's very simple. Another one, another gospel is no gospel at all. Another gospel is no gospel. The Greek word for gospel is a word, it's euangelion is the, the word, and it, what it means, the direct translation is good news or good tidings. You'll see in the verses we just read, the thing that made Paul upset is that he said, you have deserted the one who called you for a different gospel, and the people who have come among you are distorting the gospel of Christ. Now, the, this word, good news, is all over the New Testament, that what Jesus did in the world was good news. I have a passage from Mark chapter 1 that I want to read. This is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel, the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus uses the, the, the phrase twice, or it says he's preaching the gospel. He says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God's here. Repent, so change direction, and believe the gospel. So Jesus was preaching this good news from the beginning. In the Roman world, this word, good news, gospel, would get used for a bunch of different reasons, but sometimes it would be something like this. Good news, a new Caesar has been coronated. Uh, good news, a new emperor has been born, and his reign is going to bring a new age for our, our people and our places and our nation. That's the idea of what good news is. Jesus, beginning his ministry, announcing the gospel, is announcing a new age is here. Well, it turns out, as we continue to read in the Gospels, that this gospel that Jesus was proclaiming was about Jesus himself. He wasn't just talking about something else. The time has come, repent and believe, because I, Jesus, am here. Paul continues in Galatians 1, 3, and 4, saying this, grace to you, and oh, this is, sorry, the previous verses. He said, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul starts to give them some bits of this gospel, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So Paul says this initial gospel, this good news that we brought to you, speaking to the Galatians, he says you've abandoned it for something else. So I think that gives us a moment to reflect and think about what are the basics of the good news 
as Jesus presents it, and as Paul taught to the Galatian believers. A few key components of the gospel. One is this, and we see this in the previous verses we just read. Forgiveness of sin by grace through faith. So in those previous verses, Paul had said, grace and peace to you from Jesus who gave himself for your sins. One of the key components of the gospel is that all of us have sinned, we're separated from God as a result, we can have our sins forgiven by grace, undeserved favor from the Lord, and we receive that through faith. So we respond to God in faith, we receive grace, our sins can be forgiven. The really core component of the gospel, my sins can be washed away because of what Jesus has done for me. The second component of the gospel is Jesus, the Messiah's victory over the powers of evil and of death. Paul said it in verse 4 there, that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Uh, The gospel is not only that you and I are individually forgiven of sins, even though we are. The gospel is that Jesus has come to take back what belongs to him, the good world that he created. The Messiah Jesus, by forgiving our sins and taking the punishment for us, has set it up to where he can eliminate the powers of evil, but also death. And that's what we talked about in our last sermon series. And the third part is this of the gospel, God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. In Galatians 3, 4, Paul had said, according to the will of God our Father. So the basic components of the gospel is this. Our sins can be forgiven if we believe in Jesus because of what he's done for us. What Jesus has done has made it to where he will, is, and will be the Lord of everything. He's defeated the powers of sin and death. And then lastly, God's will will now have a time where it can be done on earth as it is in heaven, even though our world is broken right now. Those are the basics, right down the middle, components of the gospel. And part of what Paul is communicating to the Galatians here, and one of the things that we need to understand is this. If you try to add any extra stuff to that, meaning the gospel is this, but also if you want to be forgiven of sins, you also have to do this other thing. Uh, You have to manifest this spiritual gift or else you don't really get it. Uh, You have to do this extra thing or else you're not going to receive it. That becomes, it undercuts the entirety of the gospel. Another gospel is no gospel at all. Paul says to the Galatians, this is not just a difference of opinion with these other people that have come in. Uh, This is, they have distorted the truth and brought you something that is completely counterfeit and will lead you straight away from the Lord. Which leads to the next thing that Paul says in verse 8. He says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, and so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. So Paul uses here, uh, we call this Christian cursing. Uh, he, He says, anyone who preaches a gospel different than the one that you received from us is to be, the word in Greek is anathema, meaning he is to be damned to hell, is essentially what he's saying. So any person who preaches anything different, they, are, they should be cursed. And I want you to notice a couple things here. Paul says, and this is our second point, no one is off the hook if they distort the gospel. So another gospel is no gospel, and no one is off the hook if they distort the truth of the gospel. He says it this way, even if an angel from heaven, even if I did it, even if the other apostles that knew the Lord brought you a different gospel. The result is they should be damned to hell. That's what he says. Now, he, I, I just need to inform you, he, he's soft-selling the language here. I'm joking. He's using very strong language, but he means it. You'll notice this is not just a slip of the pen from Paul. It's not an accident. I, I don't know if you've ever found yourself saying something you didn't mean out of anger. That's not what's happening here. Paul repeats himself twice. He says, let them be accursed. I also want you to notice from the previous verses, this another one that the Galatians were hearing, it did not prop up from within their church. It came from people from the outside. Uh, We will talk more about that in coming weeks, but people came after Paul preached the gospel to them at the moment when the Galatians were the most vulnerable, meaning they were new believers. They weren't mature. They didn't know what was true from what was not true. And the seeds of discord and falsehood were sown among them. And part of the the thing that I think we need to draw from this is that we are also susceptible to having people tell us untruths about the gospel. There are people that are going to bring you messages saying this is what you need to believe that actually would lead you away from the Lord. 
And Paul has extremely strong language for them here. One of the things, I think this is a important discipleship point that you and I need to understand about this. There is no person or personality that overcomes the importance of the truth. And I, I want to give you a, a warning here, because I think this is something that all of us need to hear. You are probably going to come across people in your life as a believer that you hear them teach or say certain things that when they say it, it just rings true with your heart and with your mind. Maybe there's like a pastor or a preacher or a Bible teacher that you've heard teach before, and when you hear them teach, it, you feel like it makes the Bible come alive to you. It, it feels like you, you learn these things that you didn't understand already before. Now, that's good. You need people like that in your life. But the thing that I want to warn you is, is this. Other than Jesus, there is no Bible teacher who is perfect. Uh, there's no Bible teacher who is right about everything. And you need to be careful that if there is a person that you feel like, man, everything this person says is gold. I just need to listen to only what they say. Don't do that. Don't do that because any person could be wrong. You are responsible for knowing the truth of God's word. There is no substitute for you spending time in the word and spending time in prayer and knowing the God on a deep, intimate level. And so I just wanna warn you, it's especially when a person speaks your exact heart language, that's the person that you probably need to put up some walls against because there is no person that is more important than the truth of God's word. So another gospel is no gospel. When someone distorts the gospel, there's no person who can get off the hook for that. By the way, uh, Jesus speaks very strongly about this. At one point he says, uh, anyone who leads one of these little ones, like a children, ch like children astray, they would be better off having a millstone tied around their neck and tossed into the ocean. Uh, God, God judges very harshly people who are in a position of teaching. Here's the last thing. This is in uh, Galatians 1 and verse 10. Finally, Paul says this, for am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. Our last point is this, seek to please God and not men. So what's happening in this passage? Paul has come into the Galatian churches, giving them the basics of this good news. There was a Messiah in Israel named Jesus, he has defeated the powers of darkness and death. If you put your faith in him, he will wash away your sins and you will be who God made you to be. He preached that basic gospel to them. After Paul left, these new people have come in and they have said, no, actually, you need to do more. You need to have your men circumcised. You need to follow these dietary laws. You need to do these specific things if you want to be one of God's people. And Paul finally here at the end says, who do you guys think I'm trying to please? I'm not trying to please men. I'm trying to please the Lord. And I think this should lead us to a question here. What exactly were these new people accusing Paul of? So the, uh, the, the people that come in, these opponents of Paul, often people will call them the Judaizers. That's the, the name given to them, that they've come in and they've basically, they told the Galatians, it's good that you're following Jesus, but you also need to take the ethnic markers of uh, being of the people of Israel. And so what was Paul being accused of? Essentially, Paul was being accused of bringing not the full gospel, to the Galatians. They were accusing him of bringing Christianity light to these Gentile believers to make Christianity seem more palatable to them. That is the uh, accusation that Paul's receiving. And you've probably made, you've probably heard people make this accusation about others. Well, you're just watering down the gospel so that people will, will think it's easy to jump in. And by the way, sometimes that is a valid criticism. It's possible to water down the gospel. But Paul says to them, if I really were accommodating if I were compromising, if I were trying to please men, the thing that I would have done is that I would have continued to be a zealous Pharisee. Where was the pressure coming from in Paul's life? It was coming from the ethnically Jewish side of his social group. Those are the people applying pressure. It needs to be more like this. Now, the book of Acts gives us a lot of details about this conflict in the early church, and we will talk about it more as we read through Galatians. But the point is this. Paul Paul was saying, I'm not trying to please men. I'm not trying to make it easier to, uh, to make uh, Christianity swallowable for people. My point is, I am a servant to Christ, and I'm going to do whatever Jesus calls me to do. So, Paul's seeking to please God and not men. I do think this leads to another question. Uh, because of the strong language that Paul uses here, and even stronger language that he will use later in the letter, I got the impression when I was a young believer that Paul might have just been an inflexible person that felt like it's his way or the highway. Maybe 
you've known a person in church before that has that attitude. They have opinions about what certain things in the Bible mean, and if you disagree with them, then you're terrible, and you need to change your mind. So was Paul just this inflexible person? And I read something this week that it struck home with me when I read it. Paul was not an inflexible person looking for a fight. In fact, Paul was a culturally sensitive missionary. His whole life was that he was traveling from place to place, finding ways to connect the gospel to new people and in new ways. Paul was not itching for a fight. However, Paul was willing to compromise on some things, but he knew when and where to draw a line in the sand and say no more. And uh, there actually was an archaeological discovery this last week. I'm, I'm really excited to share this with you. Uh, we, we found footage of Paul as he was writing this part of the letter, drawing his line in the sand. I want you to watch it really quickly. You shall not pass! If that doesn't get your blood boiling, I don't know what's wrong with you. That, that scene goes so hard. Okay, that obviously was not the Apostle Paul. That was Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. Uh, but Paul knew when to say this far and no more. You shall not pass past this point. And for Paul, that issue, the uncompromisable position was, if you distort the basic truth of the gospel, if you are changing the nature of what it means to be one of God's people, that is too far. Let anyone who leads others astray with another gospel be accursed. That's the direction that Paul is speaking to these people. So these verses set the table for the entire argument that we are going to read in the coming weeks. So what I want to do very quickly at the end here is have some final thoughts, review the major things that we've talked about tonight, and then prepare ourselves for what we're going to read next. The first one is this. Another gospel is no gospel at all. There are not multiple good newses of how you get to God. There is one gospel, and trying to distort it completely changes it away from what it is and makes it no gospel at all. The world is always going to distort the truth and try and get you to go to the next thing, another one, another one. You and I need to be vigilant when that happens. The second thing is this. No one is off the hook if they distort the truth of the gospel. So that means, on the one hand, if you find yourself in a position teaching the gospel to someone else or teaching God's word to people, you have to be very careful because there is no one that is off the hook. Teachers get held to a higher standard. And then the other part is don't rely for your entirety of your discipleship on a single personality or a single person uh, because people will let you down. And the last one is this. We need to learn to seek to please God and not men. If we are gospel people and we want to live out the good news of Jesus in our lives, we need to know what the essentials of the gospels are, stick to them, and then maybe like Paul, be willing to compromise on things that are non-essentials. We need to be able to, to distinguish the real from the not real. And I think that leads us to one final question uh, for tonight. Paul cared so passionately about people knowing the basic truths that Jesus is the Messiah, forgiveness of sins is available to us. There is no other way to get there except through him. And so I think the final question that you and I then need to ask is this. Do you know the gospel well enough that it is ingrained into your heart? that is ingrained into the truth of your life? Are you trying to rely on anything else to get you to God other than grace through faith? Is there any extra thing that you feel like you need to add on to please God? Well, yes, I believe in Jesus, but also I need to do these things perfectly or else God's not gonna be pleased with me. If you find yourself trying to do that, you're trying to please God with good works, you're trying to uh, please him with the extra stuff that you think, another gospel is no gospel at all. So the final question I have then is this, do you know the gospel? And if you don't, what are you gonna do about it? 